All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the Cleveland Clinic for our webinar on BPH treatment. My name is Dr. Rafe T. Bole, and I'd like to welcome you all for what is going to be a great discussion tonight. We have a fantastic lineup of urologists here to talk to you about enlarged prostate issues and answer all of your questions. First up, Dr. Gill, he grew up in Western Pennsylvania. He did his undergraduate degree and master's in biomedical engineering at Case Western, followed by medical school and residency at the Cleveland Clinic. He sees patients at Cleveland Clinic main campus, Hillcrest Hospital, and Twinsburg Surgery Center. Dr. Day grew up in Cincinnati. She completed medical school and her PhD in bioengineering at the University of Washington in Seattle, urology residency at Stanford, and fellowship at Vanderbilt. She sees patients at Cleveland Clinic main campus in Beechwood. Dr. Beksak attended medical school and urology residency in Ankara, Turkey. He completed a fellowship in robotic urologic oncology at Mount Sinai, followed by another fellowship in laparoscopic and robotic surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. He sees patients at main campus in Fairview. These are some of the top BPH experts in Cleveland, and we'll be talking to you today about BPH treatments, but first a little overview. So what is BPH? You often hear this acronym, but what it stands for is benign prostate hyperplasia, and this means an enlarged prostate. The purpose of your prostate gland is to make fluid that goes into semen. It's around the size of a walnut, and it sits right under your bladder. Over time, it grows enlarged in size, and that's when we term it BPH. Now, this is fairly common. 60% of men over the age of 60 years old and 80% of men over the age of 80 have it. Just like the name says, it is benign, not cancer, but still, it can cause bothersome symptoms that affect your daily life. In fact, 90% of men over the age of 45 have bothersome symptoms of some kind. And these symptoms can include the following, weak or slow urine flow, the feeling of having a bladder that isn't emptying, finding it hard to get your flow going or straining to urinate, urinating more often, having dribbling after urinating or a poor stream, especially at night, an urgency, needing to find a bathroom fast. If the condition is severe, it can lead to things like bladder stones, bladder infections, urinary retention, and damage to the kidneys and the bladder. So what options do you have for treatment? Well, if you aren't too bothered yet, you could wait and just watch to see if things get worse. If you wanna do something about it, you can try medications to relax your bladder neck muscles or to shrink your prostate, but understand that you may need to take these lifelong. You could also consider a procedure. This would be your best chance to stop or avoid medication and gives you the greatest improvement in urine flow. We will talk about some of the available options for procedures in our webinar today. And with that, I'll hand the presentation over to Dr. Gill. I'm sorry, Dr. Gill, I think you're muted. Thank you very much. All right, thanks for the introduction. So when we talk about prostate enlargement, as you heard, medications are one way to go, but those are a lifelong commitment and you basically have to stay on them forever. So it's very common that we'll have guys come into the office and say, what can I do to treat my prostate? And what can I do to get off of medications or in some cases, avoid even starting them? And that's where procedures come in. There's really a large variety of procedures out there that can be used to open up or clear out the prostate enlargement. And the question that we always ask in terms of taking care of patients is which procedure is right for which prostate? And that's really been the focus of treating prostate enlargement the last few years as new procedures have, have come available. So the things that we look at are prostate size, and that really dictates whether we can do things in the office or we need to go to the operating room for a more formal surgery. And we can tell how big a prostate is using an ultrasound, a CAT scan, or an MRI. And that ultrasound can be done through the belly 
or it can be done transrectally, which is the same way that we do the prostate checks to see how big the gland is. Another thing that's critical for many of the treatments is figuring out what the prostate shape is. So you heard mentioned the bladder neck or the bladder prostate junction. That's an important consideration in treating prostate enlargement and urinary problems. If it's just a big prostate, that's a very different treatment than a place where the prostate and the bladder uh, join together if that's tightened up. The last thing that we think about is bladder function. So if a, a man has had an enlarged prostate for many, many years, the bladder can actually wear itself out from stretching out too far over time with urine. And in cases like that, you can only consider certain procedures to very thoroughly clear the prostate tissue with the hope of restoring the ability to urinate. Sometimes you may need the use of a catheter, but a lot of times you can successfully open the prostate enough to restore somewhat normal urination. Beyond that, the most important thing that underlies what prostate procedure you pursue is what the goals of the patient are. So certain procedures can help preserve ejaculation. Other procedures can help eliminate the need to use a catheter. And still other procedures can help you avoid the need for anesthesia. They can be done with numbing medication or just a little bit of medication to help you relax. Next slide. So we'll start by digging into some of the office-based procedures. And there's really three that we'll talk about. Those include water vapor ablation or steam treatment of the prostate. The brand name for that is Resume. The prostatic urethral lift, what I like to call curtain ties or little clips that hold the prostate open. That's called Urolift. And intraprostatic devices or stents. And these are permanent or temporary devices you can put in to spring things open. Next slide. So water vapor ablation or Resume the steam treatment of the prostate has been around now for about a decade, and it's proven to be very effective when used in the right prostate. It's a same day procedure. It's done in the office. Patients get a nerve block beforehand with an ultrasound probe in the rectum. We pass a needle and inject numbing medicine around the prostate. Men can also have relaxation medication or a sedation to help them sleep through the procedure. And they go home with a catheter for a few days afterwards. So the procedure is done by placing a scope up through the penis into the prostate. And then with a small needle through the scope, injecting steam around through the prostate gland. That steam kills the prostate cells. And over the next four to six weeks, the body reabsorbs the dead prostate tissue. And the inside of the prostate slowly opens up. So urination improves over a month to a month and a half, sometimes two months after the resume procedure is done. The big benefit of the resume procedure, you don't have to go to an operating room and have a formal surgery. And about 90% of men who have this are able to keep their ejaculation afterwards. So in other words, when they have an orgasm, they still have semen or ejaculate come out. But as mentioned, it's only good for some prostates. Incredibly large prostates, or prostates where there's a very tight bladder prostate junction generally don't respond very well to this. Next slide. The prostatic urethral lift or the Urolift, this is what I think of as curtain ties. So the things that you have that are holding back the curtains so you can see out the window. They're small implants made out of a polymer ribbon and small stainless steel or nitinol clips. So what you do with this procedure very similar to the resume is you have numbing gel applied through the penis in the urethra and then relaxation or sedation to help you sleep through the procedure or just feel very comfortable as it's done. A scope's placed in through the penis through the urethra into the prostate and then it's used to push over the prostate tissue and then fire the little ties in to hold it open. The interesting thing with this procedure, because you're opening the prostate up right away, is you can often go home without a catheter afterwards. And that usually depends upon what the prostate shaped like and also how strong the bladder is. So if you have anesthesia or a heavy sedation for this procedure, you may need to go with the catheter for a day or so to allow your bladder to wake up and start working again. The results for this generally take effect right away but you might have some irritation for a few weeks afterwards. 
usually by a couple weeks after the procedure, men are peeing comfortably, not having much irritation anymore, and they're doing well. About 99% of guys that have this procedure will keep their ejaculation. And again, it's great for some prostates, but not all. The really, really big prostates, or the prostates where the bladder prostate junction is very tight, won't respond very well to this treatment. Next slide. That brings us to intraprostatic devices, and these are newer. A lot of these are still under investigation and considered to be research-based uh, devices. One that is approved for use in clinical practice is the iTind, and that's from Olympus, and that's shown in the picture here. And what it is is it's basically a small, a small metal spring that's put in with a scope that pops open in the prostate and holds it open for about five days. And during that five-day period, it molds the tissue open, and it slowly cuts through the tissues to allow it to stay open and the urine to flow out. This is done with numbing gel in the office, and patients can have relaxation as an option. Generally, no catheter is needed because it's holding the prostate open, and results from this are seen in about one to two weeks. It takes about that long for irritation to wear off afterwards. Most men who have this will keep their ejaculation, and this treatment is good for smaller prostates and also some of the prostates where the bladder prostate junction is tight. Next slide. So briefly, we'll talk about some of our same day in and out surgeries here. And these are done very commonly for prostate enlargement. Next slide. The first that I'll touch on is transurethral resection of the prostate or TERP. This is your granddad's prostate surgery, what we used to consider to be the gold standard. And that's up for debate nowadays. There's a lot of other really good options out there. But a TERP is where you use a special scope to go in and basically scrape out or open up the prostate. And then all those little scrapings or pieces are flushed out of the bladder and a catheter is placed in overnight or sometimes for a few days afterwards. It is a formal surgery. It's done in an operating room and it requires some form of anesthesia. That could be the kind where you go to sleep or where you have a spinal, an injection that numbs you up from a certain level down. The results of this are pretty effective. Urination is strong from the go. Patients have irritation afterwards, usually for two to four weeks. And because this surgery scrapes everything open, including opening the bladder prostate junction, it's very rare that men will keep ejaculation after this. As mentioned, this is a very common procedure. A lot of urologists do this and do this very well. So it really is a good option for a lot of prostates. Next slide. The more modern version of this, and really the workhorse in my surgical practice, is the green light procedure or the photovaporization. And this is a same day surgery in and out of the hospital. You come into the operating room and go to sleep. And rather than scraping out the prostate with our scope, we go in and we use a little tiny laser and shine laser inside the prostate that melts the tissue away. So the analogy I give to my patients is thinking about a watermelon. The prostate's a watermelon. We're going to go in and melt all the pink fruit out of the middle of it. So you have a nice big channel to pee through. The white rind and the green skin of the melon will stay behind. I send my patients home with a catheter overnight with this, and they're able to take that out the next day. In general, the results really take hold in about two to four weeks afterwards. Over that time, men will have to pee somewhat frequently and have some irritation when they go, but that'll gradually improve day by day. About a month out, they'll be fully recovered and doing well. It's very rare that men keep their ejaculation after this procedure because it also opens up that bladder prostate junction. And as mentioned, it's the workhorse in my pr uh, practice. It's very good for a wide number of prostates, different shapes and sizes. So that really wraps up the same day procedures uh, that we do in the office and in the operating room. I'll pass it back uh, to the rest of the team. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Day, and we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about some procedures that use a slightly different concept from what Dr. Gill just talked about. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start by describing a procedure called HOLAP. Can we go next slide, please? 
So while Dr. Gill's got a watermelon, I've got, I guess I've got an orange. <laughs> um, so this procedure called HOLUP is sometimes also called a laser procedure, but it is different from the green light laser procedure we just heard about. So in this case, um, what we do with this procedure is instead of working from the middle of the prostate, like many of the procedures we just heard, we actually follow the anatomical lines of the prostate to remove the entire overgrowth from the middle. So many people use the analogy of peeling an orange, where the prostate is like an orange and we remove the fruit while leaving behind the shell or peel of the prostate. And I do want to be clear, this is not like a cancer surgery where we remove the whole prostate. All we are doing is removing the overgrowth from the middle. Now, we do send all of this tissue that we remove to the laboratory to check for cancer. Um, and, and having this surgery does not affect your ability to get treated for cancer if you do have it. Can we go next slide, please? So the whole procedure is done in the operating room under anesthesia. It can be done with the breathing tube type of anesthesia or with a spinal. Most of my patients go home with a catheter and then uh, come back the following day to get it removed. Uh, occasionally, we are able to remove the catheter on the same day. Um, and then sometimes patients may need to stay overnight for various reasons. Um, because we remove a very large amount of tissue, one of the big benefits of this procedure is that it can last a long time. It's, it's less likely that the tissue will grow back requiring another procedure. Um, also, because again, we are removing so much tissue and, and changing that bladder prostate junction like Dr. Gill talked about, most men do not keep normal ejaculations. They have those dry ejaculations. The, the prostate, the whole up procedure is actually quite versatile, and it is the main procedure that I do for uh, BPH. It works for almost everything. It can be used for any size prostate. Uh, it can be used in patients who have weak bladders, those who have had prior prostate surgery, and those who may need additional treatments, such as removal of a bladder stone or removal of kidney stones. Um, so for the recovery after this procedure, I generally recommend no strenuous activity for a couple of weeks, things like running, jumping, or heavy lifting. Um, and much like the other procedures we've talked about, folks may have some irritation with some frequency or urgency of urination for a few weeks. So I think we can turn it over to our last colleague here for the, the last set of procedures. Not sure if he was able to make it on, so uh, I'll just go ahead and discuss this. So the last set of procedures we'd like to talk about is called a simple prostatectomy. Um, it's actually very similar to what I just described with the whole up procedure, where we are removing the entire inside portion of the prostate, but leaving behind the shell or the capsule. The main difference is that the whole procedure, which I described before, is done through the urethra, through the penis, whereas this procedure is done through the abdomen and can be done in different ways. So I'll get to that in just a moment. This procedure is done in the operating room with anesthesia, and usually this is general anesthesia. The catheter does stay for uh, a few days, and the reason being that the incision uh, made to do the procedure is done through the bladder, through the abdomen. So that's why the catheter stays in for a few days. Similar to the whole up procedure, most men will not keep normal ejaculations. Um, but the nice thing with this procedure is it can be done for very, very large prostates, as well as um, for patients who have very large bladder stones or who may have some scar tissue or narrowing of their urethras. Can we go to next slide, please? So this procedure, the simple prostatectomy, can be done in different ways. It can be done with uh, an open procedure, which requires an, an incision about this size at the lower part of the abdomen. 
It can be done robotically, and there are even two different ways to do that. So it can be done with um, about four or five small little incisions in the abdomen or one slightly larger one just above the pubic bone. And all of these will have uh, excellent results, particularly in those patients with the very large prostate. We can go on to the next slide, please. So I think we can turn this over to questions from the audience at this point. Perfect. So thank you all of our experts for, for discussing some of these treatment options here with us today. Uh, don't be shy about typing questions in the chat box. Uh, we're here for you uh, to answer your questions about these about these procedures today. Someone else may have the exact same question that you do. And in the meantime, while people are writing in, take a moment to write down that phone number if you'd like to call and schedule a consultation. We'd love to see you in person or virtually to discuss further. So we have some questions coming in uh, already. Um, let's talk about symptoms. Will my BPH symptoms get worse over time, one gentleman asks, or are there different stages of the condition that you're diagnosed with and then you stay with that same stage for a long time? I'll take a swing at this one. So. We learn in medical school, there's certain parts of the body that continue to grow with age. And if you think about, you know, your grandparents or the older people you knew when you're a kid, they had really big ears and really big noses. The prostates are really big too. So prostates, ears, and noses grow throughout your life. In general, if men develop symptoms from prostate enlargement, they will usually get worse with time, but it can be a very gradual thing. Um, the speed that a prostate grows varies from man to man, and also how much it blocks things up can vary based on the shape of it. So uh, it's something that you might not notice a change in uh, from month to month or year to year, but maybe over five or 10 years. But in general, yes, things will get worse with time. Perfect. Thank you. We have some more questions coming in, this time a little bit more related to BPH and cancer. So, number one, have you had any experience, any of you, noticing that these types of procedures can cause cancer to spread? And I would think this is relevant to someone who may have been diagnosed with Gleason 6 prostate cancer that's being watched. Would they be a candidate for a procedure like this if they have BPH symptoms? And there's a follow up question to that that someone else has. Are any of these procedures used for cancer, which is entirely contained within the prostate for treatment? I'll take a shot at this. So, um, it, these are excellent questions, and we have used these procedures in patients who have got cancer, usually those who may be on active surveillance for a low grade or a low risk cancer. It does not treat the cancer, so that needs to be very clear, but it can help with treating symptoms. I am not aware of any evidence showing that uh, doing these procedures can cause spread of the cancer, but it can definitely help with managing symptoms. There are also cases where patients may require treatment, say, with radiation, um, but they want to treat their symptoms prior to get getting treated with radiation. So sometimes there is a two-step process as well. Um, there are cases, uh, as I mentioned, with the whole up procedure where we do identify cancer um, from the tissue that we remove, and that's true of any of those procedures where we remove tissue. And none of these procedures will keep you from being able to get treated for cancer if we find it in your tissue or if you were to develop it later in your life. That's very helpful. Thank you. The next set of questions is related to sexual function. So would we be able to talk about BPH as it relates to erection difficulty? Is there a connection? And number two, uh, can these can these types of BPH procedures cause effects on erections? Great question. So, you know, ejaculation, we talked a little bit about that. 
Uh, some procedures keep it, some procedures men will lose it. Erections are a slightly different topic. So back to the watermelon analogy, the nerves that cause erections are on the outside of the watermelon, the green skin. And all these procedures that we've talked about today basically maintain the white rind and the green skin of the watermelon. So the likelihood of losing erections with these procedures is fairly low in some cases. So the less invasive procedures, mostly the office-based ones, like resume, the steam, or Eurolift, the little curtain ties, uh, as well as the implants that go in the, the urinary channel, those really should have no impact at all on erections. They basically just work within the prostate and they don't cause any stretching or pushing or pulling on the nerves that produce erections. Uh, terps and uh, green light procedures, those in some cases, men might notice loss of erections. In most cases though, and what I counsel my patients about is not to really worry about that because again, we're working with the pink fruit inside of the watermelon, and we're gonna leave the white rind and the green skin there. So as long as you don't go very deeply with those procedures or stretch or push uh, on those nerves, there really shouldn't be much of an impact on erections. Some of the other procedures, the simple prostatectomies, uh, as well as in some cases, uh, potentially with very large prostates in whole lip, you're pushing and stretching the prostate, peeling out the tissue inside. And that stretching can cause the nerves that produce erections to be paralyzed for some time. So men can have a loss of erections for a period of time after certain BPH procedures. And those tend to be a more common uh, occurrence when the prostate is massively enlarged. And that's where you'll look at, at some of the other procedures where you peel things out. Um, so, yes, certain BPH procedures can affect erections more than others. Uh, unlike the cancer surgeries, uh, we don't really worry about the, uh, you know, a high potential for permanent loss of erections, um, but it is always a, a small possibility. I'll add on a couple things to that. So, I think, you know, important is that many men, and I would say most, are able to come off of their prostate medications after surgery. And a lot of those medications do cause problems with erections. So in, in some ways, by getting off the medications, you may actually help your erections potentially. And then another thought actually about those very large prostates is that having the large prostate in itself may be stretching some of those nerves, uh, like Dr. Gill was talking about with the nerves on the outside of the prostate. And so by reducing the size, by removing some of that tissue, there's been some suggestion that that also may help with reducing uh, some of the erectile issues that can occur. Wonderful. So it sounds like, if anything, potentially some temporary effect with certain procedures, but it actually may help to get off of those medications uh, if you are able to do a surgery. Uh, and, and that may have the opposite effect of, of improving sexual function in some cases as well. So certainly an individual um, individual situation for everyone, but but very hopeful even with sexual function. Can we talk also a little bit about urinary incontinence? Is there a risk of urine leakage uh, after any of these procedures? Uh, I can talk about that with respect to to hole up. So, because we're removing so much tissue, and um, as Dr. Gill said, we are pushing around a little bit during the procedure itself, everyone right after surgery will have a little bit of leakage. But the likelihood of long term or permanent leakage is only about 1%. So, we do have men do exercises after their surgery to strengthen their sphincter muscle. That's the little muscle that lives under the prostate and is what keeps you dry. Um, and so we do have folks do those exercises and majority, 99% do recover uh, full content. I'll touch base on some of the other procedures. So the other procedures, uh, including the resume, the Eurolift, um, and the green light, you can have irritation to the prostate and to the bladder area 
that your body will make it feel as though you need to urinate. And you can get a very strong urge to urinate that comes with a little bladder spasm. So after those procedures, you may feel you need to pee very frequently and you might have some trouble getting to a bathroom on time. So urgency incontinence is what we refer to in those cases. That tends to last a few weeks after those procedures where you go in and you work with the prostate, uh, the prostate bladder junction or in the urethra. Um, the simple prostatectomy and TERP, you may also have a little bit of of stress leakage in those, and that's a little leak with a, a cough, a laugh, or a sneeze. Um, those procedures, it's pretty rare for that to persist lifelong. Um, it's very important when you do those procedures to maintain that sphincter muscle that Dr. Day talked about. Um, but even then, in those cases, you still have some irritation to the tissues too. So really, after any of the prostate procedures, you'll have to pee very frequently uh, for some time afterwards and, and might have a, you know, some challenges making it to the bathroom quite fast enough. But um, for the most part, permanent lifelong leakage uh, with any of these procedures in an experienced urologist's hands uh, are, are very, very low. Um, like Dr. Day said, you know, you're talking maybe 1% to 2% across the, the various types of surgeries. That's very helpful, and that question had come up with with a few different people. So that's a, that's a great answer. Um, let's move now, if you don't mind, to some of the other potential procedures. There's a lot of interest in talking about other procedures, uh, and I'll just list a few of them. Uh, if anyone wants to give their thoughts, um, aquablation has come up, uh, the button terp has come up, uh, and PAE. I can talk about PAE for a second. So PAE stands for prostate artery embolization, and that's actually done by interventional radiologists, not urologists. And the way that it's done is they are able to identify the blood vessels or arteries that uh, feed the, the prostate, and they block those arteries such that the prostate tissue stops getting oxygen and essentially shrinks. So right now, this is mostly still considered um, experimental or mostly done just in clinical trials. Um, that being said, there are some patients where this may be a good option, those who may have very large prostates that have significant bleeding or those who may not be um, in, in good medical condition for a surgery that involves anesthesia, for example. And we do have people here at Cleveland Clinic who do perform that uh, procedure if, if there is interest or need. I can touch base on uh, some of the other procedures. So aquablation uh, is one that came up for discussion. That's a, a new procedure that's emerging uh, in different parts of the country. And what that procedure uses is a high pressure water jet to basically carve out or blast out the prostate tissue. Uh, and then after that, you go in with a scope, uh, like a TERP scope, and you clean out some leftover tissue and, and burn up the bleeding areas. Um, aquablation is showing that it has some benefit uh, for a, a pretty wide range of prostate sizes. Um, it's not very good for the massively enlarged prostates, you're still better off with a simple prostatectomy uh, or a whole lep for those. Um, and the interesting thing with aquablation is if you shave the prostate out in just the right way, there's a fair chance that men can keep their ejaculation with that. The downside to the uh, aquablation procedure is that it's still relatively new. So we don't know exactly how long the results of that can last and what kind of durability it'll provide. Um, that's really the only you know, drawback to it I see from my end. Um, it's not available in the Cleveland area yet. Uh, we are working on getting it available uh, through Cleveland Clinic Akron General. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and then um, outside of that, I, I'll kick it back to uh, Dr. Bole for other questions. Wonderful. Just going back to another potential procedure that patients may come across and wanted to know about, 
Uh, one gentleman was interested in knowing more about transurethral microwave treatment. That procedure uh, really shouldn't be done as far as I'm concerned anymore. Um, transurethral microwave therapy was something uh, that was very big back in the 90s. Uh, you basically put in a, a catheter through the urethra up into the prostate and then used little microwave elements there to heat things up. The thought was that the microwave uh, heating killed the tissue uh, and caused the body to reabsorb some of it. Um, much along the lines of what we think about with resume and the steam treatment nowadays. But the problem with the microwave therapy is it just didn't really get into the tissue much. Uh, and from the research that we've done looking at retreatment rates, uh, essentially every man that, that we've seen had that microwave therapy needed to have something else done, whether it be go back on medications or have another uh, prostate procedure. So it's really not offered uh, many places anymore. Wonderful. So as Dr. Gill said, certainly you want to know all the treatments that are available, but you also want to know what procedures we don't recommend that most urologists wouldn't recommend for you. So that's an important one. Now, going on to a little bit of a different uh, question track, um, can we ask about the success rate of some of these procedures? What are the chances that someone having a procedure would maybe need a repeat procedure in future, maybe in five or 10 years, or have to start medication in future? I think that's a great question. Um, I often think about some of this in terms of sort of a, a risk reward in a way. So you can imagine some of the you know, less invasive procedures, such as those done in the office without requiring any anesthesia, those that don't have, you know, really risks of bleeding um, or loss of ejaculation may not last quite as long. So as an example, the Eurolift, um, you may require, you know, there's about a 25% retreatment rate within five years. And then similarly with resume, you may require medications or another procedure in about 15% of men within about five years. Then when you look at the other end of the spectrum where you're talking about the simple prostatectomy or the whole up procedure where you're removing pretty much all of that overgrowth, the need for retreatment is very low, about 1% at about 20 years. So, it's uh, again, it kind of comes down in my mind to a little bit of a risk reward situation. I would echo that completely. Um, we actually did a research study at Cleveland Clinic uh, about five years ago where we looked at uh, medication discontinuation rates after the various procedures. And men who had had a uh, simple prostatectomy done. Um, you're talking a, a high, you know, 90 something percentage uh, of men being able to discontinue all of their prostate medicines. Uh, men that had had microwave therapy or um, other forms of, of uh, ablation like that done, only about 10% or so came off their medicines. And then the green light vaporization and the TERP were right around that in the middle, and that was about 60% or so. Um, so the, you know, the durability of these, um, it, our conclusion from that, and to echo what Dr. Day said, we really think about removal of tissue. Uh, the more that you can clean out, the less tissue you can leave behind, the lower the likelihood it's going to grow back, uh, and the longer it would take it to grow back and really cause symptoms again. Um, so we'll know more as, as these procedures are around longer. Um, the Eurolift and the Resume are about 10 years. Uh, those little intraprostatic uh, stents that we saw, those are, are only a few years out on the market. Um, so really uh, don't know much about those quite yet. That's great to know. So definitely important to know the procedure that you're choosing, uh, have realistic expectations and discuss with your urologist uh, about what's right for you as a patient. Can we talk a little bit now uh, about symptoms? After having a BPH procedure, what types of symptoms are more likely to be treated effectively? 
For example, we have a few gentlemen writing in about symptoms like frequency and urgency. Are those types of symptoms more likely to be cured or not? Or if they're not cured after a procedure like this, what options might they have? So um, I think that's a great question because people come in with all sorts of different symptoms, um, whether it's weak stream, waiting to urinate, um, urgency, frequency, nighttime urination. So if you think about all of these procedures, the main thing that they're doing is they're opening the channel in the urethra for you to pee out of. And so the first things that are usually addressed are things like the weak stream, the starting and stopping, straining, things like that. Um, so that's that's really treating the plumbing issue. The you know Dr. Gill mentioned earlier that the bladder kind of changes over time um, as it's kind of fighting to pee through this big prostate, and so some of those changes. Um, cause the bladder to become more irritated. And that's where the urgency and frequency come from. Um, and so that, I think the response to that um, after surgery is pretty variable between people. I think some folks, um, it completely resolves and they go back to quote normal. In other patients, it may get somewhat better, but not completely. And then even others, they don't have a lot of relief from those specific symptoms and may require additional treatment either with medication to relax their bladder or other things that we can do for what we would call overactive bladder. Uh, another comment I wanna make about this is that many patients also have nighttime urination. And the issue with nighttime urination is that it can be from so many different things. It can be because you have an overactive bladder. It can be because of your prostate. It can be from things that you would never think about, like sleep apnea. Um, I end up sending a lot of my patients to the sleep medicine team to have a sleep study done because their actual problem is sleep apnea and um, it's very confusing. So what actually happens, to make it um, a little clearer, is when you have sleep apnea, it just means that you are not breathing well and you get less oxygen to your body. This ends up putting a strain on your, on your heart, which then results in a hormone being produced. And then that hormone tells the kidney to make more urine. So it's a kind of a convoluted pathway. But ultimately, if you have sleep apnea and you get that treated, that can make a huge difference in your nighttime urination. So nighttime urination is not always the prostate. I'll pick up the um, kind of other bothersome daytime symptoms. So overactive bladder is one of the other things that can cause a lot of bother for men when it comes to urinating. They're urinating all the time. They have to constantly run to the bathroom. Maybe they're not making it there fast enough and having some leakage. And that's one of the important things that Dr. Day and I try and tease out in office visits is, you know, what's going on here? Does this seem more like a bladder problem, a prostate problem, you know, which is which? But more often than not, it's a gray zone and you're kind of in the middle. Uh, there is testing and things that can be done to try and piece that out a little bit more. It's not always necessarily that helpful, though. So one of the big things that I really focus on is getting a good history and learning about what patients are doing at home. One of the major reasons men have bothersome bladder symptoms are because of the specific things that they're drinking during the day. So caffeine and alcohol are two things that irritate the bladder and cause a lot of bladder symptoms. They make your body produce more urine, number one, which makes you have to go more often. But number two, those molecules, caffeine and alcohol, irritate the bladder lining. So even if there's only a small amount of urine in there, you're going to feel like you need to pee. And you might have some urgency to do that. So you might wind up having to go very often, but just having little bits of urine come out. Sweeteners and colorings are two other things that can do that. So if you think about Gatorade, it's basically water with sweeteners and colorings in it. That's one of the things that I've found in my patients causes a lot of bladder symptoms that are very bothersome. So one thing I talk about when we're trying to figure out what exactly is going on is being very boring for a couple weeks with the types of fluids that you're drinking. So if you have coffee, stick to a cup in the morning, don't drink it all day. 
Don't drink Diet Coke or Diet Pepsi all day. Don't drink iced tea all day. If you're on caffeine around the clock, you're going to upset your bladder and cause a lot of symptoms. Um, water and milk are fairly safe. A little glass of fruit juice here or there is fine. But you want to be boring and really stick to water throughout the day to see how well your bladder can behave. And if you can do that for a few weeks and your symptoms get better, then that may point to bladder irritation being a big component. However, if you're still finding that your stream is weak, it's taking a long time to empty, it's sputtering, it's dribbling, you have to push and strain to get the urine out, then there probably is an element of prostate blockage there or something else that's impeding your urine flow. And that's where we can help you figure out what that is. The other thing is it might be a weaker bladder. The bladder can't push very strong. It can't get the urine out fast enough uh, through the prostate or whatever's blocking things up. In which case, if you open the blockage, the bladder doesn't have to push as hard. So we can make your symptoms better in that regard. So a lot of what we do is, is not only trying to go in and operate and fix things, but it's wearing our detective hats to see if we can actually figure out what it is and, and make sure we go down the right treatment pathway. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing it's a little bit more and not so much about BPH, but other things that could be causing similar symptoms. I think that addressed a lot of what people have been writing in about. There are multiple questions about, you know, what if this is a different diagnosis? You know, how do we know that it's not something else like infection or, um, you, you know, some some other etiology? So. Uh, to everyone listening, it's it's certainly important to have that conversation with your urologist uh, so that they can figure out what what the actual issue is. And certainly, if if the problem turns out to be that your prostate's enlarged and it is your prostate, these are all the treatments we can offer. But it could be something else, uh, just like Dr. Day and Dr. Gill just went through so well. We do have some other questions now, a little bit um, more specific. Um, one question is. If someone has had radiation uh, to the pelvis for prostate cancer or another type of cancer, is there any is that a consideration for the type of treatment that you would offer? Absolutely. So radiation changes tissues. In particular, it changes how they heal, and it also changes how elastic or how stiff they can be. So Resume, which is the steam treatment for the prostate, doesn't work very well in patients that have had radiation because the steam can't go out through the tissues and get to the prostate cells. It basically gets in there and gets stuck in scar tissue. Um, Eurolift, the little implants or the curtain ties, that's a nice option for a prostate that has had radiation, uh, in part because you're not making any incisions, you're just putting in the implants to hold it open. Uh, so your likelihood of having scar problems uh, after a surgery are, are pretty low with that. Uh, it's also a smaller scope, so it doesn't stretch things as much. Um, the green light procedure, the vaporization procedure, isn't a great option in men that have had radiation either. And that's because the way that it melts the tissues away, it leaves some scab behind. And that scab can harden and form stones. And it also can get stuck to the prostate tissue that's had radiation because that tissue, once it's gotten radiation, doesn't have very good blood flow. Um, a TERP, the old fashioned scraping procedure, if it's done carefully, is a very good option for men that have had radiation because you can very precisely go in uh, and remove portions of the prostate to unblock things. It also doesn't leave scab behind, so it's less likely to result in stone formation uh, as things heal up. However, there's a higher risk of scar formation after radiation therapy. So anything that goes in through the urethra and stretches out those tissues could lead to scar formation. Uh, it can also lead to the prostate scarring down or healing abnormally. Uh, again, radiation really changes how the tissues behave. Uh, there's also a higher risk of, of permanent lifelong urinary leakage in men that have had radiation. And that's because those tissues are stiff and they don't really uh, stretch out and respond as well to a scope being inside. Um, so in men that have had radiation, we really take pause and uh, you know, 
make sure we have a really good understanding of what's going on in the anatomy before we think about uh, doing any kind of interventions. Thank you. That is wonderful to know. Now we are getting some more questions about the technology behind uh, Eurolift and the ITINE um, devices, specifically with regards to infection risk. Have you seen in your experience uh, that there is a higher risk of infection, uh, sometimes in patients who've never had urinary infections before, or in patients who are prone to infections in getting the uh, procedures where there's something placed uh, in the prostate like clips, um, or, or another such device, and can you speak to that a little bit? Dr. Gill, uh, do you want to take this one since um, I think I don't really do the Euro left very much? Sure. So, um, you know, any of these procedures shouldn't really carry an increased risk for infection. Uh, they won't give a man an infection if he's never had infections before. However, any procedure that you have where things go in the urethra uh, could potentially introduce bacteria, even though we give antibiotics around surgery and clean things up very well. Uh, also, having a catheter in around any of the procedures can potentially risk uh, infection. But usually the catheters are in for a very short time, so that risk is negligible. Um, so, all in all, you know, we really feel that the, the procedures we're discussing here tonight don't really carry a, a risk for causing infections in men. For men that have problems with recurrent infections, it is a consideration to think about something other than a permanent implant. So, putting a permanent implant in gives a foreign body or another material that bacteria can latch onto and basically serve as a source of repeated infections in the future. Um, if men are treated for infection and the urine is cleared and the bacteria are eradicated, that really should be a low risk. One of the major risk factors we see in repeated urinary tract infections in men is incomplete emptying. So guys that don't empty their bladder well have bacteria in the urine that stays in there and never gets to completely clear out. So the procedures, if they're able to aid bladder emptying and, and make that effective, can reduce the risk of infection. However, as mentioned, that you know, theoretical consideration of having a foreign body serving as a source of infection would make me take pause about recommending uh, Eurolift um, you know, in those type of situations. Uh, otherwise, the other procedures are, are all very effective um, in terms of clearing out prostate tissue and helping eliminate recurrent infections in men. I, I will add one thing to this. So, uh, one, one situation I've come across a few times now are folks who have recurrent infections, not because they're retaining urine, but because they have a bunch of stones in their prostate. And this is something we can see on imaging. So if you've had an ultrasound or a CAT scan um, and they see a lot of stones in the prostate, um, that can be a source of infection. And, and that would be one where you see the same bacteria over and over and over again. That would be a consideration. And so in something like that, we have had success with uh, these procedures where we are removing tissue, like, like the whole up procedure, because we can get rid of, of the stones at the same time. That's wonderful. Thank you for answering that. Now, we do have some questions uh, just as we're getting to the end of this session uh, about herbs and supplements. Are there any of those or any dietary recommendations that men could undertake to try and maybe slow down the growth of their prostate or limit the risk of having to have to do anything in future at all? So a lot of herbs and uh, sort of natural supplements have definitely been studied over the last few decades. Uh, a common one you may hear of is called saw palmetto, and there are quite a few others. Um, and unfortunately, the data has not really demonstrated that there is a clear benefit. I think saw palmetto is, is probably the most studied one. There have been quite a few large studies and uh, really did not show any benefit beyond, you know, like a sugar pill or a placebo. 
Um, some of the other ones that are being tested uh, have so shown some promise in, in small trials, but not at a level where I would feel comfortable recommending them at this point. I echo that completely. Um, we actually just did a podcast uh, earlier today on the, the same topic. So, um, you know, the, the big problem with dietary studies is they're largely retrospective, which means they look backwards and they ask patients and participants to recall what they've done. So if you fill out a survey that says, how often on average have you eaten red meat each week for the last 20 years, there's gonna be a lot of bias or limitations to your ability to recall that accurately. So that's where a lot of our, our research based on the impact of diet and certain things on, on prostate health has come from. So we're, we're pretty limited in that regard. Um, but to Dr. Day's point, they have studied some supplements going forward, uh, vitamin E, selenium, they've looked at those for prostate cancer risk um, and certain things. And, and you know those studies haven't really shown anything great with regard to prostate enlargement or BPH. Um, in general, though, one thing we do know is that uh, diabetes or high sugar diets tend to very strongly encourage prostate growth. Uh, and there's some good evidence from laboratory studies and also some uh, other work where they show that the pro-inflammatory state that can happen uh, with diabetes and high sugar diets can fuel uh, prostate enlargement because of inflammation. Um, so with that, what most urologists will say is good, clean, you know, healthy living, uh, balanced diet, um, consideration of maybe antioxidants, um, you know, which are generally found in fruits and vegetables, can be helpful uh, for maintaining prostate health or at least uh, optimizing it the best that we can. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Gill and Dr. Day for your expertise this evening. Uh, the last question I'll answer, essentially, it's a question saying, how do you know which of these procedures is right for you, especially if you quali qualify for any number of them? What I'll say is that we'd recommend absolutely that you come in for a consultation. You can call the number right at the top of that slide. Uh, a lot of these situations are very individual and our surgeons would be very happy to see you for a consultation and talk through further with, with each and every one of you. Uh, so we've had a great discussion here tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great night uh, and we'll see you next time.